I've always had an open mind when it comes to the mysterious creatures that might wander our world. It's partly because I've always been inquisitive by nature, and partly because of the lessons my mother instilled in me about respecting nature and being aware of my surroundings. She taught me to listen to the animals, believing they would alert us if something unusual lurked nearby. This story takes me back to when I was a teenager, visiting my dad's small hometown in Texas for a family reunion. The town was so tiny that you could stroll through its central part in less than an hour. Most of our relatives lived further out, each with an acre or more of land around their homes, providing privacy and tranquility. That evening, we joined my dad's extensive family for a hoedown near the town's edge. People were dancing, drinking, and reveling in the festivities, while my brother, one of our cousins, her friend and I, hung out on the sidelines. We engaged in typical teenage chatter, discussing school crushes and the like. Our attention drifted towards the outskirts of the party, where a fence bordered the area. The fence separated the yard from the scrubland on the edge of town. The night had fallen, and the only illumination came from the lights on the fence poles, casting eerie shadows around. As I gazed into the distance, I noticed something unusual, an object partially obscured by a small tree. It stood out because it remained still, unaffected by the breeze that rustled the other foliage. I pointed it out to my brother and cousin, who also saw it. We couldn't help but be curious. One of us suggested it might be a coyote, but we quickly realized that it was too massive to be one. Curiosity, and perhaps a bit of foolishness got the better of us, and we cautiously approached the fence. We were now only twenty yards away from it, and this mysterious figure was a further ten yards from the fence, shrouded in darkness just beyond the reach of the feeble light. We halted in our tracks, our eyes locked on this enigmatic creature. It was covered in fur, its hunched form supported by long, slender legs and human-like arms ending in sharp claws. Its head, partially concealed by the tree, had a canine appearance, complete with a long snout and pointed ears, much like a coyote's. But it wasn't a coyote. It was something else entirely. The creature's gaze met ours, and a chill ran down our spines. We hastily retreated to the party, realizing that we were now closer to this strange being than to our own families. If this creature possessed the speed attributed to werewolves in movies, the fence would have been no obstacle for it to reach us. We were stunned into silence, unable to comprehend the reality of what we had just witnessed. Back at the hoedown, we exchanged knowing glances but said nothing. Who would believe us? The next day, my family prepared to return to Oklahoma, and my brother and I secretly breathed sighs of relief, leaving behind the unsettling encounter. My cousin and her friend still lived in Texas, within the territory of that creature. I hoped they never had to see it again. Over the years, that night's encounter lingered in the back of my mind. As I learned about various creatures people claimed to have encountered in the woods, I hoped I'd never cross paths with anything like that again. However, as fate would have it, in 2019, I found myself on my boss's farm for a three-day work excursion during the summer. The farm was located about an hour from Oklahoma City and spanned 80 acres, mostly covered in woods and isolated from neighboring properties. His nearest neighbor was at least a mile away. I had visited his farm numerous times in the past and had grown familiar with the surrounding woods. There was a trail leading into the woods from the compound, and every morning I'd walk it with his dog, Duke. But I never ventured onto that trail alone, and I always carried a weapon, not because I feared encounters with dogmen or Bigfoot, but because wild boars were known to inhabit the area. However, I had never heard of any reports of dogmen or Bigfoot sightings in the vicinity, only rumors about wild boars. On this particular day, I set out toward the trail in the late afternoon, Duke by my side. The trail wasn't well-traveled, covered more in grass than dirt. As we ventured further, I could see signs of wildlife all around. Deer tracks, raccoon prints, even an armadillo scrape on the ground. Duke wandered off the trail into the trees drawn by something that had captured his attention. I called out to him, asking him not to stray too far and stepped toward the edge of the trail to join him. That's when I saw something that made my heart skip a beat. 
right at the edge of the trail, where the exposed earth met the grass, was a colossal canine-like footprint. It dwarfed Duke's prints and was much larger than even my own size 10 boot. The track appeared to be relatively fresh, no more than 24 hours old. I couldn't help but wonder what had made it. I looked back down the trail but saw no more tracks, as if this creature had leaped over the trail to avoid leaving any more prints. It had jumped a staggering 15 feet across the trail, leaving no trace of its presence. I quickly scanned the surroundings and strained my ears, but all I heard was silence. No birds, no insects, and even Duke seemed on edge. I called Duke back to my side and hastened our pace, heading back toward the barn. I didn't want to stay any longer in case whatever had made those footprints was still lurking nearby. As we reached the tree line and entered the open, I couldn't help but think that they were here in Oklahoma too, even though I had foolishly believed they would remain confined to Texas. My thoughts were disrupted when I returned to the barn. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Duke's nervous demeanor seemed to convey a clear message. We needed to leave. I briefly glanced around but the woods appeared empty. Yet, I couldn't shake the eerie sensation that we were being watched. As we made our way back inside, I couldn't help but ponder the implications of what I had seen. I remembered my mother's words. You may not see them, but they can see you. I knew that whatever left that footprint and turned that branch had been near, and it was a chilling realization. As I recounted the events of that day, I couldn't shake the feeling that these creatures were not confined to Texas alone. My brother had mentioned that his co-worker had recently claimed to have seen a dogman on the edge of his property in El Reno, Oklahoma, a mere ten miles from my boss's farm. The boundaries between fact and folklore were becoming increasingly blurred, and I couldn't help but wonder if these enigmatic creatures were closer to home than I had ever imagined. Back in the 90s, I found myself working as a park ranger in the northern part of the United States. For the safety of all involved, I won't reveal the specific state, but I can tell you it was near the northern border of America. After an incredible honeymoon with my husband, I was headed back to work, even though he wasn't thrilled about my career choice. He worried about me being alone in the wilderness, especially since I'm a short, slender woman, weighing maybe a hundred pounds soaking wet. But my heart belonged to nature, and I couldn't give up my job to stay home and have a baby, as he wished. I longed to spend days, sometimes weeks, or even months, among the trees and wildlife. Unfortunately, I never got to enjoy my favorite job again, at least not the way I used to. It was quite a drive from my husband's home, which was on the other side of the state. However, it was worth it especially during winter when the treetops were blanketed in snow as far as the eye could see. The long drives through nature were always a pleasure for me, though I can't imagine being able to stomach one anymore. On this particular occasion, it was the winter season, and I had signed on for firewatch duty. My job was to ensure that no fires were left unattended, despite the heavy snowfall. But in reality, I was there to keep hikers from getting lost, and to watch over the wildlife. The winter had been especially harsh, and I made the journey in my 92 Ford to the ranger station. After exchanging well wishes and some gossip with my colleagues, I set off for my favorite firewatch tower for the winter season. If my memory serves me well, it should have been a three-hour drive to reach the best parking spot to access the tower. As I ventured deeper into the wilderness, the road grew rougher, and eventually, I couldn't proceed much farther. I hadn't reached the parking area I had in mind, but I hoped that the conditions might improve, allowing me to drive to my preferred spot. I consulted my map, circled the spot where I had parked, and studied the path ahead. It was quite a distance to hike, but I was no stranger to it. I had trekked farther before, so I wasn't too concerned about the distance. As I began hiking through the snow, memories of what I loved about this job flooded back. The satisfying crunch of snow underfoot, the pristine white landscape adorned with occasional animal tracks, it felt like stepping into a storybook or a fairy tale. Nature had always been my one true love, despite my deep affection for my husband. 
The day passed quickly as I walked through the snow, taking breaks to sketch in my notebook and capture photographs with my camera. It felt like one of those days that blink by, and suddenly the sun was setting. Consulting my map, I realized I was nearing the tower, but I wasn't sure if I should camp for the night or proceed. The thought of entering the warm tower, meeting the ranger who had been stationed there before, and enjoying hot chocolate and a comfortable bed was tempting. Yet, the forest I cherished was quickly vanishing into the swirling abyss of white and black. It would have been easy to miss the tower completely. So, I made an educated decision and began setting up my camp, ensuring I wouldn't get lost in the snowy wilderness. I pitched my tent, packed down the snow, and stacked some firewood I had brought into a pile. A campfire crackled to life, and I followed all the proper steps for camping in the snow, something I genuinely enjoyed. I remember gazing at the distant tower, still a good distance away, as I ate my dinner, which I believe was some type of meat. It smelled like meat, but my memory was a bit hazy. After dinner, I extinguished the fire and crawled into my tent, which provided as much warmth as possible. I relished the feeling of camping again after months away. The sound of the wind against my tent lulled me to sleep, and I soon drifted into a dream whose details I couldn't recall. Suddenly, I was jolted awake by a horrifying, guttural howl. My heart pounded, and I scrambled out of my tent, clutching a flashlight tightly. I shone the beam into the snowy landscape, searching for the source of the spine-chilling noise. Hello? I called out into the frigid night. Is anyone there? I'm a park ranger. Do you need help? Where are you? I shouted again, my voice growing hoarse with every question. I scanned the surroundings, but there was nothing to be seen except for the slumbering trees. Hello, you there, I yelled once more, taking a moment to cover my mouth and warm my face with my breath. During this brief respite, I heard another shriek, this one sounding more desperate and feminine. It felt closer, and I called out again, Ma'am, are you okay? What's wrong? However, there was still no response from anyone or anything except for the wilderness itself. I tried to determine the direction from which the sounds had come, but it eluded me. As a park ranger, it was my duty to assist people in such situations, which was why I was stationed here throughout the winter. I returned to my tent, quickly gathered my gear, and rolled up my sleeping bag. There wasn't enough time to dismantle the tent. It took me about ten minutes to prepare myself fully and gather the courage to head in a direction. At that moment, my starting direction was arbitrary, but in my mind, I convinced myself that the scream had come from that specific direction. I set off into the snow, my flashlight's beam dancing across the trees. About five minutes later, another scream pierced the night, or at least it felt like five minutes. Time seemed distorted in that eerie silence. This time, I was closer to the source, and it sounded like a woman's cry. My heart raced as I shouted, It's okay, I'm here to help. Where are you? The icy air irritated my throat with each question, but I continued to scan my surroundings for any signs of the distressed person. Once again, there was nothing but the sleeping forest. Stay where you are, I'll come to you, I yelled, my voice echoing through the wilderness. I hurried off into the night, driven by the urgency of the situation. My footsteps crunched through the snow as I ventured deeper into the darkness. Another shriek echoed through the forest, and this time, it sounded almost like a word, possibly help, although it was hard to discern. The sound came from a bit to the right of the previous location. I finished warming up my throat and yelled again, I'm coming, stay where you are. I sprinted toward the source of the screams, and as I drew closer, I noticed tracks in the snow. My heart sank as I also spotted patches of blood along with boot prints. I followed the boot prints for a while, but the trail suddenly ended at a larger pool of blood. The person or creature seemed to have vanished into thin air. I spun around, my heart pounding, and while I wanted to call out in a desperate attempt to find them, a deep-rooted survival instinct kept me silent. It was as though the person had been plucked from that spot, disappearing without a trace. I took a deep breath, attempting to calm my racing mind, and considered my options. Another scream pierced the night, closer than before, 
and panic gripped me. I started running this time, not needing to convince myself of any direction. I simply fled into the night, the trees blurring past me as I weaved in and out, trying to put them between myself and whatever had produced those horrifying noises. I ran until my lungs burned and my body felt frozen from the cold. I came to a sudden stop and shone my flashlight around, searching for the source of the terrifying screams. I couldn't understand how it had followed me so easily, but then I realized that I had been shining a blindingly bright light in all directions, practically announcing my location. I pressed my thumb against the flashlight button, plunging myself into total darkness. The wind howled around me as I heard the crunching of footsteps in the snow. Slowly I moved, making every effort to remain as silent as possible. I approached the nearest tree, or at least where I had remembered it to be, and huddled down next to it, covering myself with snow. There, I waited, my heart pounding in my chest, my breath visible in the frigid air. I strained my ears for any sign of the person or thing that had been following me. The footsteps grew closer, and I heard them sniffing the air. My heart raced as the crunching sounds approached, and I covered my mouth with my hands to stifle my breathing. Then I heard another shriek, more furious than the previous ones. I shivered from the cold and trembled with anxiety as I held my breath, waiting for this unknown entity to spot me in the absolute darkness. I waited for what felt like an eternity, every passing second stretching into hours. The crunching grew nearer, and the air turned putrid, as if a septic tank had ruptured nearby. I prayed silently as the presence drew closer and closer until it passed by me. I remained still, waiting for it to emerge from the other side of the tree and seize me, but it never did. I offered silent thanks to my lucky stars and cautiously began to rise from my hiding place. The crunching sounds moved away and I dared to crawl out from under the tree. Rolling onto my side, I realized that I had been crying. My eyes stung from the tears and I wiped them away with my clothes. At some point, exhaustion overwhelmed me and I lost consciousness. I awoke the next morning and slowly extricated myself from under the bed. The stench in the room was unbearable, and the sight was horrifying. I staggered and limped down the steps of the tower, my senses overwhelmed by the gruesome scene. I ran into the woods, desperately trying to put as much distance as possible between myself and whatever had happened in that tower. I ran, and I didn't stop until I reached my vehicle. I got inside and floored the accelerator, racing back to the ranger station. I filed a report, deliberately avoiding any mention of what I suspected had been there. I only stated that I didn't see who or what it was. Eventually, I was interrogated about my story, particularly what made me think it wasn't human. I was instructed never to speak of it again. However, after hearing the accounts of other former park rangers and reading similar stories online, I couldn't help but share my experience. I still love how well America preserves its natural beauty, but I now fear that it may be to hide things like what I encountered that night. When I told my husband, he was shocked and could only hold me tightly. Yet I don't believe he truly believed my account, especially when I mentioned encountering a monster, given that I had never seen it directly. But based on all the stories I've come across, I genuinely believe I may have encountered a Wendigo, and I also believe it's still out there, lurking in the wilderness, responsible for the countless missing persons in our national parks. My name is Ben, and I had the weirdest encounter of my entire life during my recent trip to Ocean City, Maryland. I'd mentioned in a previous story that I and my friend often visited this popular beach destination, which is about three hours from where I live. This time, I decided to go alone, seeking some relaxation and respite from the wacky summer, plagued by the ongoing pandemic. I drove down in my trusty Chevy Nova on June 10th, excited to avoid any unnecessary stops along the way. Upon arriving at the condo, I swiftly unloaded my bags onto one of those hotel wheel carts, which proved to be a more efficient alternative to lugging my luggage up the stairs. Our condo was on the fifth floor, beachfront, 
and waking up to the soothing sound of crashing waves every morning was a true luxury. As I peered out from the balcony, I noticed the ocean looking rather choppy, and there were plenty of people dotting the beach, with not much space between them. I'm the type who enjoys the beach view from a distance, but doesn't particularly relish getting sandy or diving into the water. Unless, of course, I find myself in a more secluded spot with fewer people around. The day passed by, marked by a sudden rain shower around 2 p.m., which quickly cleared the beach. Seeing this as an opportunity, I seized the moment and decided to head down to the shore for some surf fishing. Rain poured down relentlessly as I cast my line, though I didn't manage to catch anything. But there's something about fishing that makes me feel truly alive, akin to the thrill of bow hunting. The first night came and went, and I ordered some delicious seafood for dinner before retreating to my freshly made bed. The following morning, I brewed some coffee and contemplated my day ahead. Although I had brought my Nintendo Switch, I felt a compelling urge to step outdoors and soak up the beauty of the beach. It was then that I decided to visit Assateague Island. For those unfamiliar, Ocean City is essentially a massive sandbar, surrounded by various islands and small pieces of land. Assateague is one such place, a national park, and it had been recommended to me by my next-door neighbor, who was studying to become a park ranger. The island was a natural playground, featuring protected marshlands, beaches, swamps, forests, and even wild horses that had roamed there for generations. While there was a dune trail for off-road vehicles, my 1970 Chevy Nova was ill-suited for the sand, given the risk of rust. Arriving at Assateague, I parked in one of the visitor lots and began exploring. First, I ventured into the swamp trails, only to be mercilessly attacked by mosquitoes. Regretting not having brought bug spray, I soldiered on and then made my way through the beautiful marsh waters, observing crabs and small fish darting around my legs. Eventually I found a quiet stretch of beach and decided to lay out on the sand. Thankfully I had remembered to bring a towel this time. I closed my eyes, basking in the warmth of the sun, and lost track of time. It must have been around noon when I first arrived. But when I awoke, darkness was already descending upon the horizon, and I realized I had fallen asleep under the scorching sun. As I tried to sit up, I let out a scream of agony. My skin was searing, and despite having applied sunscreen earlier, I had been badly sunburned. It felt as though my skin was bubbling and peeling away before my very eyes, and I couldn't help but shed tears. I've endured my fair share of injuries, but sunburns are a different kind of pain. Now, this is where the truly eerie part of my story begins. I was contemplating how to hobble back to my car when I heard a loud splash from the ocean. Typically such a sound wouldn't have alarmed me, as large fish and even sharks were known to frequent these waters. In fact, I had once caught a massive sand tiger shark near Assateague two years prior. However, this splash was different. It was close, maybe only seven feet from the shore, which was peculiar. Large fish usually didn't venture so close to the beach, and the noise it was making was unsettlingly loud. In my rush to get up, I dropped my bag and car keys, my body protesting every step I took toward the water's edge. But then it made a sound I would never forget, a haunting combination of a mountain lion's cry and the deep calls of a colossal whale. It was eerie, sad, and entrancing all at once, defying explanation. My mind immediately conjured up tales of sirens and mermaids whose haunting songs lured unsuspecting sailors to their doom. I didn't truly believe in mermaids, but with the vastness of our unexplored oceans, who could say what mysteries might dwell beneath the waves? My thoughts raced as I backed away from the crashing waves, which had grown smaller now. Whatever had made that sound was moving closer to the shore, and I began to hurry back to grab my bag. Panic welled within me as I made my way to the spot I had been lounging in, all the while feeling my sunburned skin peel and burn. I shone the light of my phone on the sandy ground, searching for my keys, and there they were, partially buried beneath the sand. I dropped to my knees, scraping them in my haste to retrieve the keys. As I was about to get up I met its gaze, 
The creature before me was like nothing I had ever seen. It was pale, almost translucent, resembling a jellyfish in some respects. Its skin appeared aged yet muscular, devoid of any hair. Its long slender legs were strangely tall, akin to those of a basketball player. Its hands were amphibious, and it possessed something akin to a tail, but its face was the source of true horror. The face was eerily featureless, reminiscent of a clean mannequin's visage. The only discernible features were a nose and a tiny slit, presumably its mouth. As I stared in abject terror, I couldn't help but smile at it, a foolish, futile gesture. Perhaps I entertained the fleeting thought that this entity might possess emotions. To my astonishment, it returned the smile, but it was all wrong. The tiny slit of a mouth began to expand, tearing its face apart to form an unnaturally large grin. Blood trickled down its face as it smiled back at me, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth glistening in the beam of my phone's flashlight. It was a sight that would haunt me until my dying day. In sheer terror, I turned and ran, screaming like a child. Surprisingly, no park ranger or passerby heard my panicked cries as I sprinted back to my car. I could hear it screaming back at me, a mocking, otherworldly sound. I leaped into my car and sped away, my heart pounding in my chest. When I reached the safety of my condo, I raced upstairs, locked the door behind me, and struggled to regain control of my erratic breathing. As I finally composed myself and collapsed onto the couch, the sunburned agony still coursing through my body, I realized that I had narrowly escaped something truly inexplicable and horrifying. The next day, I visited a local clinic to have my sunburned skin examined. They prescribed a lotion to alleviate the burns, and I headed home immediately. I scoured the internet, desperately searching for any explanation for what I had witnessed. Skinwalker, alien, or some other shape-shifting cryptid, I couldn't find an answer. I want to thank Just Creepy for sharing my story and encounter, and I appreciate the support from his channel during these challenging times. If anyone reading this has any insight into what that creature could have been, please let me know. The memory of that encounter continues to haunt me, and I yearn for answers that may never come. My name is Ryan, and I'll never forget the terrifying experience that unfolded about two and a half years ago. It's a story I still relive in my nightmares, and it has left me scarred with a touch of PTSD. Let me assure you, this story is not a work of fiction. It's a chilling reality that my friend Jake and I endured. It all began in June, during a time when the pandemic was wreaking havoc worldwide. At that time, I was living with my sister and her two children having taken them in after she fled her abusive husband. Desperate for employment, I had been working as a social worker and counselor for abused kids at a group home. But after a few months, myself and a few colleagues, including my close friend Jake, were let go. The loss of my job hit me hard. I had bills to pay, a mortgage to meet, and I was responsible for my sister and her kids. I needed a job urgently. One evening, while scouring Craigslist for job opportunities, I stumbled upon an intriguing one. They were looking for people to work at a B&B that was about to open. They needed live-in housekeepers, a cook, and a front desk clerk. Offering a tempting $20 an hour plus free room and board, with weekends off. It was an offer too good to pass up, even if it meant stepping away from my career field. I called the number listed in the Craigslist ad and a man with a southern accent answered. I expressed my interest and suggested I could come in for an interview the following day. However, he surprised me by insisting that I come that very evening. It was already late in the afternoon, and darkness was setting in, making it an odd time for an interview. Nevertheless, he claimed they were desperate, and that my immediate presence would greatly help. I agreed and asked if I could bring my friend Jake, who was also job hunting, the man agreed, gave me his name, and provided the address. I informed my sister and her children about my plans, and despite their concerns and warnings about responding to Craigslist ads, I headed out to explore this job opportunity. I picked up Jake, and together, we embarked on the journey to the mysterious job interview. As we drove, 
Jake expressed his skepticism about these seemingly too good to be true $20 an hour jobs, but my desperation pushed me to believe that it could be legitimate. The drive took us deep into rural, wooded areas, far from the main city. It was a long journey, filled with endless trees lining both sides of the road. Upon arrival, we found the BNB sitting back from the road, resembling a southern plantation house. A skinny young man named Jordan greeted us on the porch. His appearance was more fitting for a skater park than a BNB. He wore a peculiar smile as he welcomed us and mentioned that we were the fourth and fifth applicants interviewed that day. He added that the previous applicant had been hired on the spot. This raised eyebrows since immediate hiring was a rarity. Without much thought, we followed Jordan into the BNB. He led us to the kitchen and mentioned that Michael would also like us. Just as Jake began to reply, a tall, imposing figure suddenly appeared behind us, towering over us like a professional wrestler. This was Michael, the owner of the BNB. After the introductions, he guided us through various rooms and shared that Charlie, his brother, was the mastermind behind the operation, while he, along with his son Jordan and daughter Marissa, would manage the day-to-day -day affairs. Michael explained that Charlie had some affiliation with the government, piquing my curiosity. However, when I inquired about the nature of Charlie's government work, Michael evaded the question and redirected us to his office for the interview. Entering Michael's office, we were met with a chilling sight. Shelves and tables adorned with taxidermy and embalmed animals. Deer, alligators, wolves, and even a boar's head were on display. Although bizarre, I brushed it off as a quirky hobby. Jake and I sat down at Michael's desk, ready for the interview, but it soon became evident that this interview was anything but ordinary. Michael asked a series of bizarre personal questions that were completely unrelated to the job. He inquired about our last physicals, prescription medications, and other intrusive details. It felt inappropriate and unnerving, but Michael insisted that it was for workplace safety reasons. I considered leaving, suspecting this might be a scam, but desperation for a job and Michael's reassurances convinced me to stay. Michael concluded the interview by declaring that we were hired. Relief washed over me. I finally had a job. Michael then showed us around the BNB, revealing its dilapidated condition. Only four rooms were remotely presentable. The rest were in terrible disrepair, including one with significant water damage from a recent roof leak. We also met Marissa, Michael's daughter, who appeared disheveled and disconnected. I didn't want to be rude, so I ignored her condition. We met the other employees, Katrina and Rob, and encountered Charlie, who exuded an eerie, emotionless aura. He showed little interest in us. I assumed our visit was over, and we'd return on Monday to begin work. However, Michael had one last surprise in store, a walk through the wooded nature trail on the property, which he believed would attract guests. Although it was already dark, he handed us flashlights and armed himself with a shotgun. Jake and I hesitated, feeling uneasy about following a stranger into the woods at night, especially one wielding a firearm, but we didn't want to jeopardize our newfound employment. We trekked along the trail. Michael discussing plans for picnic tables and bonfires. It wasn't long before I heard faint murmurs and whispers in the distance. The eerie sounds grew louder as we ventured deeper into the woods. Jake and I exchanged alarmed glances. We weren't alone in hearing this unsettling chorus. Michael remained oblivious to the whispers, and we continued following him. Suddenly, I spotted a dim light through the trees, and we stumbled upon a clearing. A blazing fire illuminated the area, revealing about half a dozen figures dressed in black hooded robes. To the left, obscured from our view, lay something gruesome, a mangled animal with blood evident. Realization hit us like a freight train. We had walked into a gathering of a cult or ritualistic group. Michael turned to us with a twisted smile, proclaiming it to be the beginning of a hunting ritual. Panic set in as we realized we were in grave danger. Michael raised his shotgun and fired it into the air, yelling something about the hunt. Frozen with fear, I couldn't move. This couldn't be happening, but it was undeniably real. 
We had either stumbled into an elaborate scam or something far more sinister. Jake snapped out of it before I did. Ryan, run, he shouted, sprinting back toward the trail. We dashed through the woods, blindly following the path, our hearts pounding. Gunshots echoed behind us, accompanied by furious shouts in pursuit. We zigzagged, unable to tell where the shots were coming from. By some miracle, we made it back to my truck, unlocked the door, and sped away just as the group closed in on us, firing at my tires. Jake suggested going straight to the police, but I knew our story would sound too absurd to be believed. We opted to remain silent about the ordeal and told my sister and nephews that the job wasn't a good fit. Weeks later, I secured a job at a local fast food restaurant and Jake and I never spoke about that fateful night again. I avoided passing by the B&B, &B, always on edge, fearing they might come after us. Six months later, I moved to another state for better job opportunities. To this day, I still have nightmares, haunted by the possibility that Charlie might recruit others for a similar sinister scheme. So, I implore you, be cautious when responding to Craigslist ads. If it could happen to me and Jake, it could happen to anyone. Stay safe and trust your instincts. I've always had a knack for finding the perfect spots for camping, a skill I attribute to my years growing up in the wilds of Georgia. This time, my choice was Eatonville, Washington. It was a picturesque town, the kind that you'd imagine on a postcard or in a dream, nestled between lush green hills and clear, starry skies. We arrived in the late afternoon, the sun casting a golden hue over the landscape. My wife Anna hummed a soft tune as she helped set up the camper while our kids, Sarah and Joey, ran around in the open space, their laughter echoing through the trees. The youngest, little Lily, was just a year old, snug in her portable crib, gazing at the new surroundings with wide, curious eyes. I lit the grill, the smell of cooking burgers mingling with the fresh pine air. Anna set the picnic table, her hands moving deftly as she laid out the plates and utensils. We had a simple rule, no phones, no tablets, just us and nature. It was our way of reconnecting, a brief escape from the chaos of city life. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire. I cracked open a beer and watched the flames dance, their light reflecting in my family's eyes. It was moments like these that I lived for, the quiet simplicity of being surrounded by the ones I loved. We roasted marshmallows, and I shared stories from my childhood, tales of camping trips and close encounters with wildlife. The kids listened, their eyes wide with wonder. The first two nights passed peacefully. The days were spent exploring the trails and the nights, stargazing and telling stories. I slept soundly those nights, the kind of deep sleep that you only get when your mind is at ease. But the third night, everything changed. I woke up suddenly, my heart pounding in my chest. It was past midnight, and an eerie silence enveloped the camper. Then, I heard it, a whooping sound, distant yet distinct, breaking the stillness of the night. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard, a chilling guttural cry that sent shivers down my spine. Anna stirred beside me, her eyes wide with fear. Hunter, what was that? She whispered. I shook my head, unsure. We listened intently, the sound growing closer. It was accompanied by a stench so foul it made my stomach churn, a mix of hot garbage and rotting roadkill. I peered through the window, the dim yellow light from our outdoor setup barely piercing the darkness. Maybe it's a bear, Anna suggested, her voice trembling. But I knew better. I'd encountered bears before and this was different. This creature, whatever it was, seemed to move with an eerie intelligence, its presence unnerving. Anna clutched my hand, her fingers cold. Our kids slept soundly, blissfully unaware of the terror lurking just outside. I felt a protective instinct kick in, a primal urge to keep my family safe. The creature let out another whoop, louder this time, right outside our camper. The RV trembled slightly and I held my breath, praying for it to pass. That night, as we lay in fear, 
I knew our peaceful camping trip had turned into something we'd never forget. Something was out there in the dark, and it was too close for comfort. Lying in our camper, my heart racing, I felt a sense of dread wash over me. The eerie whooping sound outside seemed to pierce through the walls, each cry more unsettling than the last. Anna clung to me, her body trembling with fear. I tried to reassure her, but my voice was a mere whisper, lost in the chaos of the moment. As the creature circled our camper, its immense size became apparent. Even in the dim glow of our outdoor lights, I could make out a towering, shadowy figure moving with an unsettling grace. The stench that accompanied it was suffocating, an assault on the senses that made my stomach churn. I've spent enough time in the wild to know the sounds and behaviors of most animals, but this was different. This was no bear. Its movements were too deliberate, too intelligent. It let out a low growl, a sound so foreign and menacing that it chilled me to the bone. Anna's tears streamed down her cheeks in silent terror. We huddled together, trying to make ourselves as small and as quiet as possible. The kids, thank God, remained asleep, oblivious to the nightmare unfolding just outside. The creature's whooping intensified, a haunting chorus that seemed to shake the very air. It was right in front of our RV now. The camper trembled with each of its movements, a terrifying reminder of its immense power. I remembered the stories I'd heard, tales of Bigfoot, creatures of legend that roamed the remote corners of the world. I'd always dismissed them as just that, stories. But now, in the heart of the Washington wilderness, I wasn't so sure. The minutes stretched into what felt like hours, each second a test of our courage. I held my breath, listening as the sounds gradually moved away the whooping growing fainter until it finally disappeared into the night. When the silence returned, it was a cold comfort. We were safe for the moment, but the fear lingered, a tangible presence in the cramped space of the camper. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. Instead, I watched the first light of dawn creep through the windows, the beauty of the morning a stark contrast to the horrors of the night. As the sun rose, Casting its warm glow over the campsite, I knew our lives had changed. We had come to Eatonville in search of peace, and found ourselves face to face with a mystery as old as the hills themselves. That morning, as we stepped out of the camper, we were greeted by the sight of other campers, their faces etched with the same mix of fear and curiosity that I felt. They too had heard the sounds, the whooping that had shattered the stillness of the night. Together we gathered around the unmistakable evidence left behind, a set of colossal footprints, unlike anything any of us had ever seen. It was a moment of shared disbelief, a realization that we had encountered something truly extraordinary. The sense of wonder was overshadowed by a primal fear, a reminder of our vulnerability in the face of the unknown. As we packed up our belongings, ready to leave this place behind, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had stumbled upon a secret, a hidden truth that lay just beyond the reach of understanding. Our encounter in Eatonville would stay with us, a haunting memory of the night when the legend of Bigfoot became all too real. The light of dawn did little to ease the tension that had settled over the campsite. I stepped out of the camper, Anna close behind me, her eyes still red from the night's tears. The kids, thankfully unaware of the night's ordeal, we're curious about the sudden change in our plans. We're heading home early. Adventure's over, I told them, trying to mask the tremor in my voice. Outside, the camp was abuzz with activity. Other campers, faces drawn with a mix of fear and intrigue, were gathered in small clusters. They spoke in hushed tones, pointing at something on the ground. I walked over, my curiosity overcoming my apprehension. There, right in front of our camper, were the footprints. They were unlike anything I'd ever seen. Enormous, deep imprints that bore the unmistakable outline of a massive foot, much larger than any human or known animal. They carved a path through the campsite, a physical testament to the reality of the previous night's terror. Did you guys hear that thing last night? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Nods and murmurs of agreement met my question. 
One camper, a middle-aged man with a weather-beaten face, pointed at the footprints. Look what it did right in front of your camper, he said, his tone a mix of awe and disbelief. The sight of the footprints sent a shiver down my spine. They were real, tangible proof that what we had experienced was no dream, no figment of our imagination. This was something else, something beyond the realm of normal understanding. The air was thick with the scent of pine and the lingering, unspoken fear of the unknown. People took photos, their cameras clicking in a desperate attempt to capture the inexplicable. I stood there, rooted to the spot, my mind racing with questions that had no answers. The decision to leave was unanimous. One by one, the campers packed up their belongings, eager to put distance between themselves and the unexplained mystery of the night. Even the campsite manager, a gruff no-nonsense type, seemed unsettled as he issued refunds. We packed up in silence, each of us lost in our own thoughts. The drive back was quiet, the usual chatter and laughter absent. The encounter had left a mark on us, a shadow that lingered in the corners of our minds. Once home, I felt compelled to report the incident. I reached out to the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, BFRO, detailing our experience and the evidence we had found. Their response was measured, skeptical, yet intrigued. They promised to investigate, but I knew the chances of finding anything conclusive were slim. The days that followed were a blur of normalcy, a stark contrast to the surreal experience we had lived through, but normal felt different now, tinged with the knowledge of something unexplainable, something that defied logic and understanding. As I lay in bed each night, the memories of that encounter played over in my mind. The whooping sound, the enormous footprints, the fear and wonder they inspired. It was a reminder of the mysteries that lay hidden in the wild places of the world. A testament to the fact that, despite our advancements and knowledge, there are still things beyond our comprehension. Eatonville, once a place of peace and relaxation, had become something else to us. A symbol of the unknown, a reminder of the night when our world was turned upside down. We had come seeking a simple camping trip and left with a story that would haunt us for the rest of our lives. The days following our return from Eatonville passed in a haze of normalcy, but beneath the surface, the memory of that night lingered like a stubborn fog. When the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, BFRO, contacted me, saying they were heading to the campsite, a part of me felt a rush of relief. Maybe they could make sense of what we had encountered. I met the BFRO team at the campsite a few days later. The drive back was surreal, each mile bringing me closer to the place I had sworn to leave behind. The team was a mix of seasoned researchers and enthusiastic volunteers, their equipment a testament to their dedication. We walked through the campsite the memories flooding back as I showed them where we had found the footprints. The BFRO team moved with a professional detachment, measuring the prints, taking soil samples, and discussing theories in low, serious tones. I watched them, a bystander in my own story, feeling a mix of hope and skepticism. One of the researchers, a woman named Dr. Hayes, approached me. We've seen prints like these before, she said but it's rare to find them so well-preserved. Her eyes held a spark of excitement, the thrill of the chase evident in her voice. As the day wore on, the team combed through the area, their cameras and recording equipment at the ready. They interviewed other campers who had stayed nearby, collecting stories and sightings. Each piece of evidence added to the puzzle, but the picture remained incomplete. Night fell, and with it, an unsettling quiet. The BFRO team set up night vision cameras and audio recorders, hoping to capture any lingering presence. I stayed with them, my curiosity outweighing my apprehension. The woods seemed different in the darkness, every rustle of leaves and snap of a twig magnifying the tension. But the night passed without incident. No mysterious sounds, no unexplained movements, just the quiet, indifferent forest and the stars overhead bearing silent witness to our search. In the morning, Dr. Hayes shared their findings, or lack thereof. It's not uncommon for these investigations to yield more questions than answers, 
she admitted. The disappointment in her voice mirrored my own. As the BFRO packed up their equipment, preparing to leave, Dr. Hayes offered a small smile. This doesn't mean it's over, she said. We'll keep looking, keep investigating. These mysteries have a way of revealing themselves in time. I watched them drive away, the dust from their vehicles settling back onto the empty road. The campsite was quiet again, the excitement of the investigation replaced by a palpable sense of mystery. On the drive home, I reflected on the experience. The encounter in Eatonville had opened a door to a world I had never truly believed in. The lack of conclusive evidence from the BFRO didn't deter my newfound curiosity. If anything, it fueled it. The mystery of Bigfoot, once a mere legend, had become a part of my story, a chapter in my life that remained unwritten. The unknown had a way of drawing you in, of keeping you searching for answers in the shadows of the unexplained. And as I drove back to the familiarity of my life, I knew one thing for certain. The search for answers would continue, both for the BFRO and for me. In the weeks following the Eatonville incident, life returned to a semblance of normalcy, but the shadows of that night lingered in the corners of my mind. At home, surrounded by the familiar, the experience felt surreal, like a fragment of a half-remembered dream. Yet, the footprints etched in my memory and the whooping sound that echoed in my dreams were reminders of a reality that defied explanation. Anna and I didn't talk much about that night. It was as if by acknowledging it, we'd give it power, let it seep further into our lives. But the unspoken understanding hung between us, a shared experience that had subtly shifted the contours of our world. The kids, thankfully oblivious to the true nature of our early departure, had moved on, their resilience a stark contrast to our silent grappling. Little Lily, with her innocent gaze, remained a source of light in the shadow of our unease. I found myself drawn to the lore of Bigfoot, an interest I had never entertained before. It was a pursuit of understanding, of trying to make sense of what we had encountered. The internet was a rabbit hole of theories, sightings, and skepticisms. I read accounts that mirrored our own, stories of peaceful nights turned into encounters with the unknown. Yet, in each story, the mystery remained, a question mark hanging over the reality we thought we knew. The BFRO reached out occasionally, updating me on their ongoing investigations. They hadn't found anything conclusive, but their dedication to unraveling the mystery was a source of comfort. It was a reassurance that we weren't alone in our experience, that there were others who believed, who sought answers. As the seasons changed, the lure of the wild called to me, but the thought of returning to Eatonville, to that campsite, was a line I wasn't ready to cross. The wilderness, once a refuge, now held an undercurrent of unease, a reminder of the thin veil between the known and the unknown. I took to spending evenings on our porch, gazing at the woods that bordered our home. The sounds of the night, once a symphony of nature's tranquility, now carried a hint of mystery. Each rustle of leaves, each distant call, seemed to hold a deeper significance a whispered hint of the secrets hidden in the depths of the wild. The encounter had changed me, not just in my perception of the world, but in my understanding of myself. I had always prided myself on my rationality, my grounded view of life. But faced with the unexplainable, I found my beliefs challenged, my skepticism giving way to a cautious openness to the mysteries of the world. In quiet moments, I would find Anna looking out at the woods, her expression a mix of wonder and apprehension. It was a look I understood all too well. Our journey had taken us beyond the boundaries of our ordinary lives, into a realm where legends tread the line of reality. The Eatonville encounter, a fleeting moment in the grand tapestry of life, had left an indelible mark. It was a reminder of the vast, unexplored mysteries that lay just beyond our understanding an invitation to embrace the unknown with a sense of awe and reverence. As I sat there, the night unfolding around me, I realized that our encounter with the unknown was not an end, but a beginning. A beginning of a journey into the depths of the unexplored, a journey not just through the wilderness, 
but within ourselves. In the stillness of the night, I knew one thing for certain. The world was far more mysterious and wondrous than we could ever imagine, and our story was just one thread in its vast, unfolding mystery. The night air was cool and crisp as I sat by the campfire with my grandfather. We were in his backyard, deep in the heart of the Arizona desert, a place where the sky stretched endlessly, painted in shades of purple as night fell. Stars twinkled like distant fires, and the moon, full and imposing, hung low over the distant mountains, casting a soft glow over the rugged landscape. My grandfather, a man whose life story was etched in the lines of his weathered face, had a voice that crackled like the dry wood in our fire. It was a raspy, gravelly sound, the result of too many cigars and sips of whiskey over the years. His eyes, wide and dark, seemed to reflect the flames as he settled into his chair, an old but sturdy thing that creaked under his weight. Way back when I was a boy, about your age, he began, his voice taking on a distant, reflective tone. I leaned in closer, the fire's warmth comforting against the desert's nocturnal chill. My grandfather lived just outside an Apache reservation with my great-grandfather, a tough man who had come back from the war and started a ranch, raising horses and cattle. The land was tough, rough, with dirt good for growing nothing but thornbrush, he continued, his eyes glazing over as if he was seeing the past unfold before him. He spoke of a night, long ago, when his mother fell ill. He and his father had to drive to town for medicine, a journey of about fifty miles through the desert, over a creek that had long since dried up, passing old abandoned farmsteads that stood like ghosts in the moonlight. As he spoke, a log in the fire cracked sharply, making me jump. The sudden sound seemed to break the spell of his story, and I found myself eagerly asking, What happened next, Grandpa? He chuckled, a low, throaty sound. Settle down, boy. You'll hear soon enough. His tone was serious now, almost somber, as he delved back into the story. They were driving in an old Ford pickup truck, he told me, the kind that seemed as tough and rugged as the men who drove it. The darkness was thick, the only light coming from the truck's headlights, slicing through the night. He recalled the engine beginning to sputter, the truck slowing to a jerky stop. God damn it, his father had muttered, guiding the vehicle to the side of the road. The truck coasted to a halt, and his father stepped out into the inky darkness. I could almost feel the cool desert air as he described it, breezy and refreshing against his hot face and neck. His father was getting water from the back to cool the engine when my grandfather smelled it, a stench like rotten eggs. Sulfur. His nose also picked up the smell of carrion, reminding him of dead cattle bloating under the scorching sun until they burst. The stench was so foul he gagged, and a strange tingling sensation spread across his skin. Just then, the wind died down, leaving the air heavy and still. The cab of the truck filled with the stench. But there was no answer. My grandfather's heart pounded in his chest, a fear unlike any he had known gripping him. He locked the door, reached over to lock his father's door, and that's when he saw it. A shadow moving swiftly across the road, illuminated briefly by the dim light of the truck's headlights. It was something inexplicable, something that made his blood run cold. My grandfather paused his story, spitting a wad of tobacco into the fire, his gaze lost in the flames. I realized I had been holding my breath, the suspense of his tail gripping me. I was sweating despite the coolness of the night. Well, what happened? What about your father? What did you see? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. He sighed, a deep, weary sound. A creature, he said, his voice barely audible. But it's more than just that. You see, there are legends, old legends, about creatures like the one I saw that night. I sat there, under the starry sky, listening intently as my grandfather wove his tale, a story that would stay with me for the rest of my life. I'll never forget that night driving through the Arizona desert with my grandfather. The road stretched out before us like a dark ribbon, 
winding through a landscape that felt as ancient as time itself. The truck's headlights cut through the night, casting eerie shadows across the abandoned farmsteads that dotted our path. My grandfather's tale, steeped in mystery and the supernatural, had me completely captivated. He described how, as a young boy, he and his father set off on a seemingly mundane trip to town, a journey that would soon turn into a night of unforgettable terror. The truck, a sturdy old Ford, rattled along the rough desert roads, its engine humming a steady rhythm in the otherwise silent night. The only signs of life were the occasional cacti and brush that dotted the barren landscape. As they drove, the sky above was a blanket of darkness, pierced only by the sharp glints of stars. My grandfather recalled the sense of isolation, how the desert seemed to swallow them whole, leaving them utterly alone under the vast, unyielding sky. But then, without warning, their journey was halted. The truck's engine began to sputter and cough, its rhythm faltering until it came to a jerky stop. My grandfather remembered his father's curse, a sharp exclamation lost in the vastness of the desert. He watched as his father, a silhouette against the dark, moved to fix the truck, leaving him alone inside the vehicle. That's when the atmosphere shifted. The cool desert air, once a relief against the heat of the day, now felt charged with an unspoken threat. A sense of foreboding washed over him, prickling his skin and setting his nerves on edge. He described the smell that hit him then, a stench of sulfur and decay, so potent it made him gag. It was an unnatural, unsettling odor that seemed out of place in the dry desert air. His heart pounded in his chest, a drumbeat of fear escalating with each passing second. His calls for his father went unanswered, the silence of the desert swallowing his voice. He remembered the stillness that followed, a suffocating calm that hung heavily around him. And in that stillness, he sensed something else, a presence, something lurking just beyond the reach of the truck's dim headlights. It was then that he saw it, a shadow moving swiftly across the road. It was only a glimpse, but enough to send a jolt of terror through him. The creature, whatever it was, moved with a grace that belied its size, disappearing into the darkness as quickly as it had appeared. My grandfather paused his story, his eyes reflecting the flames of our campfire. I could see the impact that moment had on him, even after all these years. The fear he felt as a boy was almost tangible in the air between us. What was it, Grandpa? What did you see? I asked, my voice trembling with a mix of fear and excitement. He looked at me, his eyes grave. I didn't know then, he said slowly, but I would soon learn the truth. That night, I came face to face with something from the old legends, something that defied explanation, something that would haunt me for the rest of my life. Sitting across the campfire, my heart pounding in my chest, I listened as my grandfather continued his harrowing tale from that fateful night in the Arizona desert. His voice, roughened by time and memories, carried a weight that made the story all the more real and terrifying. He spoke of the moment right after seeing the shadow dart across the road. Alone in the truck, with his father nowhere in sight, he felt a deep, primal fear. The desert, once a familiar place, now seemed alien and menacing. The stench of sulfur and decay hung heavy in the air, a reminder of the presence he had just witnessed. Then my grandfather began to explain about the legends he had heard as a boy stories passed down through generations of Native Americans. He spoke of the skinwalkers, beings of ancient myth, steeped in dark magic and mystery. According to the lore, skinwalkers were once warriors, who through a deal with the spirits, gained the power to transform into animals, taking on not only their physical forms, but some of their essence as well. He described these creatures in vivid detail, beings that walked on the hind legs of deer, with the sinewy muscular torso of a man and the head of a coyote, but all wrong, distorted and grotesque. Their mouths were filled with teeth sharp as bowie knives, and their eyes, he said, glowed with a malevolence that could chill one's soul. As he spoke, I could almost see the creature in my mind's eye, 
a nightmarish figure straight out of a horror story. He told me how these skinwalkers were feared among the tribes, known for their cunning and ruthlessness. They were tricksters, able to mimic human voices, luring unsuspecting victims into their grasp. But what scared me the most was the power they possessed, the ability to wear the skin of another person, to become them, if only for a short time. This was why they were named Skinwalkers. It was a chilling thought to imagine a creature that could take on the appearance of someone you knew, someone you loved, and use it against you. My grandfather's voice trembled slightly as he recounted his thoughts from that night. Alone in the truck, he had grappled with a terrifying possibility. What if the creature had taken his father's form? The thought had paralyzed him with fear, the uncertainty of it more frightening than any ghost story. He paused, looking into the fire as if it held answers to the mysteries of that night. I could see the burden of those long-ago events in his eyes, the way they seemed to look beyond the fire, beyond me, into a past filled with shadows and fear. What happened to your father? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper, caught up in the spell of his story. My grandfather sighed, a sound of weariness and age. He came back, he said. But for a moment, I didn't know if it was him or something else. That uncertainty, that fear of not knowing, it stayed with me for a long time. The fire crackled between us, a barrier against the darkness of the night. I sat there listening as the tale of the skinwalker unfolded, a story that blurred the lines between legend and reality, leaving me to wonder at the mysteries that lay hidden in the depths of the Arizona desert. The fire crackled and popped, casting eerie shadows across my grandfather's face as he reached the climax of his story. The night around us seemed to hold its breath, the stars twinkling like distant watchful eyes in the vast Arizona sky. I leaned forward, hanging on every word, completely engrossed in the tale of the skinwalker. My father eventually came back, my grandfather continued, his voice heavy with the weight of the memory. He climbed into the cab of the truck, his movements awkward and strained. For a moment, I was frozen, my mind racing with fear. Was this really my father, or had the skinwalker taken his form? The way he described that moment sent chills down my spine. I could almost feel the same paralyzing fear he must have felt as a young boy, alone in the dark with a creature of nightmares lurking nearby. The fear of not knowing if the person next to you was really who they appeared to be was a terrifying thought. My grandfather told me how he scrutinized his father, searching for any sign that might reveal the truth. The tension in the truck was palpable, a thick, suffocating blanket of uncertainty and fear. Finally, his father spoke, mentioning getting the medicine for my great-grandmother. It was such a simple, mundane statement, but to my grandfather, it was enough to confirm that this was indeed his father. But how could you be sure? I asked, unable to contain my curiosity. My grandfather looked at me, a hint of sorrow in his eyes. I wasn't completely sure, not until I saw it, the skinwalker, running alongside our truck, keeping pace with us as we drove. It was a horrifying sight, its eyes glowing yellow in the darkness, its mouth twisted into a sinister grin. He described how the creature ran with an unnatural speed, its twisted form a blur in the night. My grandfather's father kept his eyes fixed on the road, his hands gripping the steering wheel tightly. Don't look at it, he had warned in a stern, urgent voice. That was the moment my grandfather knew for sure that the man beside him was his father. The story concluded with them arriving back home safely, but the experience left a lasting impact on my grandfather. He spoke of how the encounter with the skinwalker had changed him, how it had opened his eyes to the mysteries and terrors that lay hidden in the world. As he finished his tale, the fire between us had dwindled to embers, casting a soft, warm glow in the cool desert night. I sat there, processing the story, feeling a mix of fear, awe, and wonder. The line between legend and reality seemed thinner than ever, the mysteries of the desert more profound and unfathomable. My grandfather leaned back in his chair, looking up at the starry sky. 
That's the power of the old legends, he said softly. They teach us that there's more to this world than what we see, that there are things beyond our understanding. I nodded, a newfound respect for the old tales and the mysteries they held filling my heart. The story of the Skinwalker, a tale of fear, bravery, and the unknown, would stay with me forever, a haunting reminder of the mysteries that lay hidden in the vast, enigmatic desert.